Well, we're going to the book of Revelation uh, tonight, and we're going to be beginning in chapter 4. And this is going to be part 8 of our study, if I'm keeping these numbers correct. And tonight we're going to talk about the end of the world. It would be hard to find an intelligent person that does not agree that something drastic uh, must happen in the near future. And um, the feeling is not just confined to those that go to church anymore and those that are considered to be Bible thumpers anymore, but this feeling of uh, frustration and chaos uh, is now felt among uh, not just people in America, but we're also hearing it being expressed in other countries around the world. In fact, it used to be if you spoke of these uh, biblical uh, impending catastrophes that seem to be coming on the horizon, uh, if you mentioned them, you were automatically labeled as being a doomsday prophet, but not anymore, because today even the mainstream society is beginning to take seriously the conditions that prevail in our world, which we say are Bible prophecy coming to pass. These are clear warnings that there is a catastrophe that is certainly on the horizon. And we, uh, as, an Amer as an American nation, we hear it all the time in the news, we cannot continue to go down the same road that we've always been traveling politically, economically, socially. Folks, when you just talk about social issues, we are one perverted nation today. I saw today there was a man that was paying alimony to his wife and, and then he found out his wife became a man. And so he wants to buck against that, not give alimony to that. Just the fact that that's a subject that's in the public domain is an astounding thing to us in this generation. But something's going to happen that's going to bring about uh, some horrific changes, not just in America, but around the world. And whether we're speaking about um, changes socially, uh, politically, economically, or even religiously, it's a shared feeling around the globe that something uh, is going to happen, something drastic is going to happen. Now, there are preachers from different um, denominations, we would call them cults, like the Moonies, uh, Hare Krishna, uh, those with, um, what is it, Garner, Ted Armstrong, the um, uh, Scientology, those that believe that uh, if we just hold on, peace and love is going to flood the world through all of their uh, faithful um, religious devotions and eventually they say good will overcome evil and it's going to just push the evil out. And this is going to be a utopian society. But I would beg to differ because the Bible paints a very different picture. There's also those that would suggest, and I'm not saying these are from religious cults, but even people, some, the very few in number, that believe the church will go through the great tribulation, they're preaching now, right now, that you ought to store up food, water, uh, you ought to uh, store up survival items enough that are going to help you last through these troubled times that are coming on the world. In fact, I read recently that canned water, canned food, plenty of guns and ammunition are being stored by those that are not religious, but those that call themselves survivalist. They're expecting to outlive the troubles which are coming on the world. They intend to crawl in some hole somewhere in the ground, stay there till it's all over, and then crawl back out and start a brand new society. Well, those are different views, but they're also different views from the religious perspective, people that view uh, the end of time in a different point of view from religion. And so uh, it really depends on who you're listening to is how the world's really going to end because everybody has a different point of view. Some believe that the Lord is going to come back to this earth with wrath and fury. He's going to completely annihilate every sinner that's still living on the earth. And then he's going to set up a kingdom of peace upon the earth. Others are suggesting that mankind will continue to stockpile nuclear warheads uh, until it reaches the point where some nutcase and the world's filled with them is going to finally push the button. And when they do, it's going to begin a nuclear exchange that will cause one great nuclear holocaust around the world. Uh, they believe it'll completely obliterate everything that's living on the earth. In fact, some scientists are saying if we have a nuclear exchange today and it becomes global, that it will knock the earth off its axis. 
And if that happens, the earth will be burned, it'll be wobbling uh, through outer space, knock it off its course and so forth, and all humanity and all life on earth as we know it will be dead. Those are only a few theories that people come up with about the end of time. But when you examine those theories, I want to tell you there's one source of truth. And all those are our theories. This book is truth. And according to this book, those are just the opinions of men. Now, there may be a lot of weird ideas and concepts about things, uh, catastrophic things that... Um, Men may bring uh, uh, to the table as being the gospel, it's truth. Uh, they had a vision, they saw a number, all of these kind of weird things. But there's only one source that we go to for clarification, and that's the word of God. So we're going to begin tonight uh, dealing with that subject, and it's going to be a long subject, but Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now it's important to note here that when the Apostle John was writing the book of Revelation, he did not divide this book into chapters and verses like we have now. Do you know why the book is divided into chapters and verses? Anybody ever thought about that? It's done so you can find a verse when you're looking for it. It's done so you can easily reference where those scriptures are. Uh, my mother used to have a little thing. In fact, when she died, I inherited that. But it's a little plastic rock that she got at a Christian bookstore probably when I was uh, three or four years old. I remember it all the way back as far as my memory goes back, and they had little promises that were in the top of that. And that rock was supposed to be symbolic of the word of God, and she would always pull out uh, from one end of that a promise and read the promise every day and put it in the end, and some of you have no idea what that is. But those promises helped to train people years ago and they would take their special ones, their favorite ones. People used to send them in letters and all kinds of things. And they were things that had references to it. And when you would ask them about a scripture that was encouraging to them, they would tell you where it was found. They knew exactly where it was found. But that's not what they did in the scripture. They did not do that, and John did not do that when he wrote this. There was no division of chapters. There was no division of verses. In fact, the chapter and verse divisions were made in the Bible many years later. So with that in mind, verse 1 of chapter 4 was a continuation of verse 22 of the preceding chapter as far as John the Apostle was concerned. He did not stop here and continue this as a, or, or view this as a break in the subject matter and now begin something totally new, something uh, on a completely different subject than what he had already written. And so the first words used in chapter 4 also suggest that it was a continuation of what John had finished writing just now because he used the words, and after this. What was he talking about after what? We just, he had just written to the seven churches of Asia. We just uh, studied over the last several weeks, which uh, these churches were thought to point out that they represented periods of time and history through which the church endured since Pentecost. We studied Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and last week we dealt with Laodicea. While there were seven churches that John wrote to here, there was not just seven churches in Asia. In fact, there were many, many, many churches that were throughout that region that are not listed here. But these were representative churches. And they were symbolic to represent certain church periods or ages since Pentecost. And notice here that the first or the final church letter was addressed to the church of the Laodiceans. We covered that last week. It was not the church in Laodicea. It was not the church um, of Laodicea. It was the church of the, of the Laodiceans. It was the people that had run the church. It was a church that was lukewarm, according to John's letter. She said she was increased with goods and had need of nothing. But the Lord said, you don't even know your condition. You're naked, you're hungry, you're desperate. Destitute. 
We said last week that Laodicea certainly represents the church age that we live in right now, and I think most people would agree with that when you look at our churches and our society. We also said that this probably, no doubt, is the final church age. So if you look at these churches in this manner, or from that point of view, the term here, after this, it has an even greater significance. Because it now seems that John is saying, after the church has run her course. After the church, the bride of Christ, has passed through these ages of her destiny. After this, then all the things that are going to happen after this, they can only happen after the church is gone. So when you look at this verse, from that point of view, this verse is speaking to us of the rapture of the church. I want to look at some important statements which stand out in this verse. First of all, he said, a door was opened. The opening of a door either signifies there's an exit or there's an entrance. Both of those would apply to the church because we are looking for an exit out of this world. But we're also looking for an entrance into that heavenly kingdom. That's the goal. That's the reason that we're in this. And so both of these would be applicable to the church. We're also, uh, regardless of how you may, may view this, both of those can apply to the church. And also notice here that he said there was a door opened and it was in heaven. And that's very important because uh, in every other verse, our attention was drawn to things on the earth. Now our attention is being drawn or focused on heaven. John directed throughout the other studies that we've done, he directed his comments to the church, those of, of us that are still here, the New Testament bride of Christ. But now he says after this, when the church age is ended, when the last soul has been saved, when the last person is buried in the name of Jesus in baptism, after this is finished, there's going to be a final day for the church. The journey that we're on is going to be over, and, and then our attention is going to shift to heaven because that's where we're headed. Now, the word suddenly is a good way to describe how things are going to change for the church during the time of the rapture. One moment we're going to have our feet on this earth, going about in our daily activities, and the next moment we're going to be gone. We're going to be in heaven in a moment. We're going to be caught up to be with the Lord and meet him in the air. What an awesome hope that that should bring to the church. And John said here, the first voice I heard, he said it was as it were trumpet. John was now speaking here as the representative of the church. Not one of the seven churches. John is part of the bride of Christ who is speaking now as the representative of all the church. Who is now experiencing in the spirit what you and I are going to one day experience, in fact, all of those that are blood-bought, they're going to experience in reality. He said, I, the voice, first voice I heard was, as it were, a trumpet. Reading that statement automatically makes you think of the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Also his words in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, and 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. That's the one sound that every blood-bought saint of God is waiting to hear. That's the one sound everybody that knows who the Lord is is waiting to hear. We want to hear the Lord call the church Home, call us, come up hither. The use here of the trumpet to call the church to a great meeting in the sky, this is not a new concept uh, or something that's different with the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God led Israel out in the wilderness. In fact, it was also called the church in the wilderness in Acts chapter 7, verse 38. And trumpets were used to call the people to march or move forward. Also in Numbers chapter 10. 
Moses was told to make two trumpets of silver and the use of silver was always very significant because it spoke in typology of redemption. And the trumpets were used according to the scripture to call the people together for a special a message from God. They blew the silver trumpets to call the elders together for a time of counsel. They would call men of war together in times of battle. And the silver trumpets were also used as well to call Israel forward in their wilderness march. That's important because when Israel finally reached that land that they had waited for for so long, that promised land, and then they subdued it, they would, uh, would no longer have any reason for sounding the trumpet to signal them to move forward because the journey or the marching days were over. They had finished there, but the church is still waiting for that day. We're still on a march. We're still waiting for direction from the Lord. We're waiting for that trumpet sound that's going to call the church up hither to march forward to move on into the heavens to be with the Lord and that's what our ears should be tuned to the voice that John heard said come up hither and once again this is the welcome call that we should all be waiting to hear John heard those words spoken to him but one day in the spirit as it were but one day we are going to hear it in reality our ears are actually going to hear that sound somebody said what if you're deaf it doesn't matter if you've got the Holy Ghost deaf ears are going to hear it it doesn't matter if you've got Alzheimer's disease and you can't tell one sound from the other every ear is going to hear it and everybody that's filled with the Holy Holy Ghost, they're going to be quickened in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to be caught up hither to be with the Lord. This was an invitation to John to come up to the Lord's side. And we know that because John was in the spirit here, and that's how he was caught up in the spirit. It was a spiritual experience to John, but those of us that are going to hear that sound in the near future, it's not going to be a spiritual experience. It's going to be a reality. Your physical bodies are going to be changed from whatever ailment you've got. Brother Don Johnson wrote a song one time, said somewhere between here and there, there's going to be a healing service and there's going to be one great healing massive wave that's going to go in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And every ailment you've got is going to be done away with when we finally hear that trumpet of God saying, come up hither. Paul said the Lord will then change our vile body, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now I like this part because the voice said to John, I will show you things which must be hereafter. This is interesting to know because if you look at that verse 1 again, the last words and the first words of this verse are almost identical in their meaning. After this, and then he ends the verse by saying, hereafter. The catching away of the church will end the glorious church age. A long, victorious history of the church will be over. The law ended with Calvary and the resurrection. But this church age that started then is also going to end. And it's going to end with a marriage supper of the Lamb and a great coronation service. I've never been to a place where we crown somebody. But we are going to a coronation service where we are going to be there when we crown him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What a celebration that's going to be. The Queen of England has never seen a crown like that crown. Never seen jewels like that. Never seen a ceremony like that. We are going to be there. We have an invitation to a coronation service of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's going to be an awesome event. Those who have been baptized in his name. Those who have been filled with his spirit. Those through the years that have been confronted with so many obstacles that have tried to prevent them from reaching their goal. That's the people that's going to be caught away. Those that hell has fought against every step of the way. Trying to get them to stop their progress. It's going to be a battle wearied and battle scarred. A host of people that are going to in a moment be caught away to be with the Lord. Away from all of their troubles. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more death. No more 
pain, no more suffering, no more hunger, no more wars. It's going to be an awesome occasion that ought to cause the church to daydream about it and get happy in your living room. You ought to get happy driving in your car because that's the day everybody is longing for. In that day, God's glorious church is going to be gathered, the scripture said, from the east and from the west, from the north and the south. They're all going to come together for one great hallelujah meeting in the sky. There's going to be martyrs there from Stephen all the way down to the last person that gives his life for his testimony. There's going to be missionaries there that have jeopardized their health and life to carry this good news message to foreign lands and foreign peoples. There's going to be faithful saints of God in local assemblies that have been faithful throughout the years and people thought they were unimportant. The church is going to be raptured from automobiles and airplanes, from factories and office buildings. They're going to vanish from Walmart and from their homes and even nursing homes. They're going to vanish from doctor's offices and emergency rooms, from school classrooms and operating tables. Some of you are going to vanish at work and your babies are going to vanish from daycare. But thank God it's the glorious day that we've waited for for all of these years when our bodies are going to be changed and we're going to hear the Lord say, welcome home. That's what we're in the church for. I'm telling you, there has never been a day like that day when all of God's people are going to meet together. Those that have been dead for years, you're going to high-five them on the way up. We're all going to be gathered together to be with dead saints and apostles and prophets of the past. It's going to be a celebration like the world has never known. We ought not to get afraid when we talk about the rapture. It ought to send cold chills up and down your spine. It ought to make you get up in the morning and get excited and start doing a dance because this might be the day. This might be the sounding of the trumpet and we could be going home to be with the Lord. That's the hope of the church. Hallelujah. The term he uses here, hereafter, this speaks to us of the events that are going to take place after the church age. A time when the church is moved from this earth. We're taken away. We're taken out of this mess. These events are then going to take place. The next ones that we're going to be studying about, they're going to take place after you and I are gone. And the events in the following chapters of Revelation deal with those events, and these are going to all have far-reaching effects upon the earth. The catching away of the church marks the end of a glorious era and the beginning of the darkest time any human mind could ever imagine. The rapture is the dividing line between the church and those that are going to be faced with the horrible events that have never been faced by anyone since the beginning of time. On one side of the division are going to be happy people that are going to be rejoicing with the Lord and their loved ones that have gone on before. On the other side are going to be those that are in the world still left here on the earth filled with unimaginable fear and terror because of those things which are coming in the day of tribulation. I don't want to be here to be eyewitness to what happens after the church is gone. I want to be one of the names in the big list of people that have disappeared and the graves that have been robbed. Somebody turned over the stones and opened up in the ground and dead people rose again to be with the Lord. I want to be in that number. Oh, I like verse 2. He said, and immediately, immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. This statement here, immediately I was in the Spirit, was a very descriptive term. It was used to describe the suddenness of the rapture. It's going to happen so fast there will be no time to pray. 
It will happen so fast that the procrastinators that would not go to the water and be buried in the name of Jesus, there'll be no time to do it then. It's amazing the people that don't have time to live for God today. On the day the trumpet of God sounds, everybody will have plenty of time for God then. It'll be amazing how quick their schedules are going to clear. There will be nothing more important than going down in that water in the name of Jesus. There will be nothing more important important than falling in an altar and weeping before a judging God. There will be nothing more important than seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but then it will be too late to pray. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Amen. The rapture is the dividing line. I want to be on the side where they're rejoicing. When the Apostle Paul described the change here that's going to take place in our bodies, he described it as occurring in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, it's really impossible for us to grasp that. I don't know who it was back in 75, 76. Somebody took a high-speed camera and they watched somebody blink their eye. I don't know what they said it was, 164th of a second or whatever it was, 167th, whatever it was, trying to describe how fast it was. Well, I don't know how fast it is. I can't comprehend in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, but somebody said, it's going to be Halla here and Luya there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I said them both, so it didn't happen. But someday it's going to be Halla here and Luya there. Oh, what a day it's going to be. Folks, I got cold chills going up and down my spine thinking about that. I can't imagine what the day is going to be like after the rapture on this earth. But I can imagine in my mind when we finally get there, there's going to be 30 minutes of silence. You know why? Because it's going to take your breath away. When you look there and see that splendor of that place, you're going to pinch yourself and smack yourself. Am I alive? Am I dead? What just happened to me? But I'm going to tell you, it's going to be the greatest splendor, the greatest mind-boggling beauty you have ever seen in your life and it's going to be eternal. There'll be no devil there. There'll be no tempter there. There's not going to be any separation there. We're not going to cry there. We are going to be with the Lord forever and forever and forever. Don't you want to go there? Don't you want to go there? Hallelujah. I want to go there. John said, I was in the spirit, which was an expression he used in a previous verse when he was describing his visions of revelation. These for John are spiritual encounters. John has moved here from one place to another throughout these revelations as the Lord reveals these events that are going to transpire in the last days. He's not there literally. It's in the spirit. And now he's taken to heaven in verse 2. This was all done to John in the spirit. It also should signify to us how actually one day the church is going to be caught out of here in the moment and we're going to be immediately in the presence of the Lord. We are in a space age, uh, a modern age of space travel when I think the fastest spacecraft known to man goes over 40,000 miles an hour. We cannot even comprehend with that speed that we have not even reached the nearest star. And yet, John said immediately. <laughs> it's going to be instant. What a God we serve. Amen. Amen. What a God we serve. John so said, I was in the spirit. That, that also should be a statement that should be taken very seriously by each one of us. Because this is an indication of the condition that all of us must be in. We must be in the spirit if we're going to hear the sounding of the trumpet. 
Someone said, well, I got things to do on Monday morning. I'm a busy person. That doesn't mean you can't go about uh, by your own, uh, doing your own job and concentrating on the things you're doing. But you always need to be aware that I'm listening for the sound. I'm not listening for the lunch bell to blow. I'm not listening for the whistle to blow to say it's time to go home. I'm listening for that trumpet to sound that finally is going to catch us out of here. You say, well, I don't want to go without my wife and children. I want us to be all in the same family and go together. I can assure you if she's at Walmart and you're at your job and the kids are at home or some of them are at school, you'll all meet together in the same place because it's going to be in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be a great occasion that I can't afford to miss. John said, behold a throne in one set. Every time there is a reference in the book of Revelation to the throne in heaven, it is always in the singular form. There is never any reference to more than one throne. Even in the Old Testament passages in Isaiah chapter 6, which is a famous one, there is only one reference to one throne and one sitting on that throne. Now, while it's true that the word one in Revelation here, in this verse, is in italics, which means it was not in the original, the word was added because the very next verse states, he, in speaking of the one sitting on the throne, and that word is singular. It will not be they sitting on a throne. There's not going to be three thrones with three co-equal persons. There's going to be one on the throne. They're not going to try to crowd in there and see which one can get in the middle and which one's on the left and which one's on the right. It's not a big wide love seat that they're all going to sit on. There was one throne and there was one sitting on that throne. There is no indication in the scripture whatsoever that more than one is involved in the throne. Not only in this passage, but in every other passage where a throne in heaven is mentioned, there is never, ever a reference to more than one sitting on the throne. The one sitting on the throne is none other than Jesus Christ the Lord. And we're not surprised uh, by that because Jesus even said, stated very clearly that one time, uh, or the time was going to come, he would sit in the throne of his glory. Matthew 19, 28. And John is witnessing that time of glory when the Lord is going to reign from that throne. Now, that throne that John's speaking of here is the throne in heaven. But during the kingdom age, there's also going to be a throne set up on this earth. And there's only going to be one sitting on that one too. And it's the same one sitting on the throne in heaven. Now verse 3 said, And he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in, the sight, in sight like unto an emerald. Now look at this statement again. He that sat was like looking at. Break this down for you a little bit. He that said was like looking at a jasper and a sardine stone. We should first point out here that chapter 21 of Revelation, if you want to write this down, verse number 11, the jasper stone is spoken of as being clear as crystal which according to typology, it was said to be an example or a type of the sinless beauty and perfect glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, who no flaws could be found in him. He was without sin. The Bible said neither was there guile to be found in him. So the jasper stone described in Revelation 21 11 as being clear as crystal is used to refer both to the Lord Jesus Christ as well as the city of God which comes down from God out of heaven, and that's going to be the home of the church. In fact, the term crystal here, it's used to describe also the throne upon which the Lord was sitting. The city which comes down from God out of heaven for his church, the river which flows out of the throne of God are also described as being as crystal. Uh, other, the other word here, sardin, or also called sardis, this stone is blood red. Now that's important because when you put these two stones together, they paint a beautiful picture, a symbol here of the Lord in reference to both his glory, 
his purity as well as his sacrifice as the sinless lamb who shed his blood on Calvary to atone for all of us. He said, well, what does those stones represent to us? I can tell you that every redeemed Jew, every Jew that was ever baptized in Jesus' name, that received the Holy Ghost, that are going to stand before the throne of God, and there are many that have been, they're going to clearly recognize the significance of these stones because these stones are also the first and the last stones that were in the breastplate of the high priest of Israel. Exodus chapter 28 Verses 17 through 20. And the one on the throne was recognized by these two stones. And he was also the one that was identified in the scripture as being the first and the last. The beginning and the end. The alpha and the omega. So there's another thing to consider with those phrases. Because the firstborn son of Israel was Reuben. And the name Reuben means behold a son because it was a beginning. It was the first son. Behold a son. But the last son of Israel was Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And both of those names are significantly applied to the one who is sitting on the throne. He was the firstborn, but he was also the last. Amen. He was the Alpha and the Omega. First letter and last letter in the Greek alphabet. He was the beginning and he's the end. He's the first and the last. In fact, he's also described as the one that is, that was, and that is to come. He fills all space and time. And that's the one that sits on the throne. And then John described here a rainbow round about the throne. But this was no ordinary rainbow. Ordinary rainbows are made up of seven primary colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But this rainbow was said to be likened to an emerald. The color of an emerald is sea green. The color green in typology, it represents life. Life. Meaning the one sitting on the throne, he is the giver of life. He's the author of life. Paul said in Acts 17, 28, that in him we live, we move, and we have our being. The bow reminds us of the covenant that God made with Noah after the flood in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Even 4,000 plus years later, that bow continues to remind us that we serve a God that keeps his word, a God that keeps his promises. He's a covenant God that's always faithful. And when you see this uh, rainbow presented here around the throne in this emerald color, it is green, it represents life, but it also reminds us the one sitting on the throne that is the giver of life he also keeps his promises as well. Verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Four and twenty seats. The word seats there are translated to be thrones. The vision broadens here now to include a group of 24 sitting on thrones. They're round about the throne. There's only one the throne. But there's four and 20, 24, that are sitting round about the throne. Now the Greek word here translated seats is thrones. It's translated seats in five of the places. You want to write these down? Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Revelation 4 and 4. Revelation 11 and 16. Revelation 13 and 2. And Revelation 16 and 10. 38 other places in the book of Revelation, it's always translated as thrones. But why the translators chose to translate it seats in these five places, we don't even know. Because the word seats is a completely different Greek word. But the real question is not whether it's a seat or a throne. The real question is who is the four and twenty elders? Of course, you always run into diverse opinions about this too. But I'm going to try to answer this from the scripture. 
I want to start here by examining the passage and first note some things here that may be helpful for us to identify who it is. First of all, notice that they're crowned with crowns. Jesus and his saints are the only ones you can find in the scripture that are ever described as wearing crowns. The Bible never said there was an angel wearing a crown. So that should eliminate the 24 elders here as being angels. In fact, the very concept here where they're called elders tell us that they're not angels because angels were never called elders. Thrones in the scripture were only associated with two things, men and God. There is no biblical record whatsoever to an angel that sits on a throne. So why are you stressing that? Because there's some people feel like it's angels. It's not angels. And they're also said to be wearing white raiment. Again, that term does not apply to angels. However, we do find saints and Jesus wearing white raiment. Revelation 6 and 11. You can write these down. I'm not covering these. Revelation 7 and 9. And Revelation 19 verses uh, 8 through 14. White speaks of righteousness, which the saints of God have been given only through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. We are not righteous in our deeds. We're not righteous in our acts. We're righteous only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags. It'll never, it'll never be good enough. Our righteousness only comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. And from that point of view, it would seem that these 24 elders, they're redeemed men that have the honor of, of setting with the Lord in some kind of a capacity of governing. And if they are uh, representatives, like the seven churches were representatives, if they're representatives that appear before the throne of God to represent all of the redeemed, then it would stand to reason that they are both Old and New Testament saints that are being described here. Also in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, they are also uh, seen uh, joining in the song of the redemption, both the Old and New Testament. So we know that they are redeemed men. They are not angels. The term elder, and I'm closing with this, it's usually uh, used in the Bible to represent a head of a city, uh, a family, a tribe, or a nation when you use the term elder. But why they would choose 24 that's a different question. But I want to tell you that numbers in the scripture represent something. Amen. God's word has a lot of numbers that represent things. And so it's quite probable that the 24, as, as it's often represented in the scripture, would represent God's governing or judging number. You can write this down. I'm not going to read these 19 verses. But 1 Chronicles chapter 24 Verses 1 through 19, David had made here the 24 heads of the families of the priest to represent the entire priesthood. Maybe these 24 uh, that sit on the thrones then are representatives, 12 from the Old Testament, 12 from the New Testament. In fact, it should be noted here that both Israel and the church are represented in the New Jerusalem. We'll study in Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 through 14 later on. Also, don't forget that the promise Jesus made to his apostles in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, was concerning the time when he would sit on his own throne, in his own glory, and beside him would be the 12 apostles. They would sit there and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So at least 12 of those thrones have the 12 apostles on them. The Lord knows what he's doing, and I've said this before, but some people view heaven as this retirement center, this nursing home with a bunch of rocking chairs on the front porch. It's all smoky and hazy and clouds everywhere, and we're all wearing white robes and got huge wings, you know, you can't hardly get through a doorway, all those kind of things, and that's what they picture heaven is going to be about. And we got little halos above our head, and we're all strumming on cloud, and these, these little, sitting on clouds, strumming on these little old harps and floating around. It's not going to be like that there is something awesome planned some awesome plan that God has we are going to rule and reign with him throughout eternity 
It's not going to be a nursing home you're going to. We are going to a place where we're going to be doing something throughout the ages of eternity as it rolls on. This life is only a vapor. That's going to be eternal. However long you think your life has already been, it doesn't even compare. It's not even a drop in the bucket compared to what it's going to be like when we get on the other side. Next week we're going to begin with Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to talk about the lightning and thunder and voices that come from the throne. Seven lamps, seven spirits, a sea of glass, the four beasts who are full of eyes before and behind. The first beast is said to be like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had a face as a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. You probably already know what all that means, don't you? And they each had six wings and were full of eyes within. And they rest not day nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. And then these beasts were given glory and honor. Uh, when they were giving glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the Bible said the 24 elders, they fall down before him uh, who sat on the throne, they worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They are and were created. It's going to end chapter four may sound like some very strange things, but they're not difficult. Listen, folks, by the time we're finished with this study, you will have a better understanding of the book of Revelation than most preachers that I know. If you'll stick with this and, and pay attention to this, not just be a Wednesday night to just relax and catch up on a few Zs, uh, you'll understand this book better and better as we go along, it'll be a picture that'll begin to unfold. There's some glorious things planned for the church. There's some glorious things, and I want to be a part of that. Amen. There's some terrible things coming, but I want to be a part of the great things that are coming.